coming here and welcome to all of you. Today we have a very interesting presentation coming from George Joseph, uh, who, is, uh, who is a master uh, interventionist on AOTA. He has uh, uh, also shown us some uh, wide variety of cases uh, affecting the AOTA apart from atherosclerotic aneurysms. He also has done some great work on Takayasu's disease involving the AOTA. So I really don't know what case he has picked to discuss with us today. And uh, welcome to you, George. And uh, if you are ready to share your screen, uh, we are ready to start discussion of your case. I will request all the participants who are here to uh, please mute themselves uh, when the uh, presenter is making his presentation to avoid noise. And uh, everybody is welcome to post questions on the chat so that you know, we can pick up these questions and have a discussion amongst the moderators. Over to you, George. You can maximize your presentation if you wish. And is the presentation uh, yeah. visible? It's very, well, it's very well visible and you're very clearly audible. Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here in this meeting with all of you and uh, honored to have such a uh, eminent faculty listening to my presentation. And I hope I can keep you entertained for the next half an hour or so. So um, Atul had told me to present a complex aortic intervention and I've selected a case of residual type A aortic uh, dissection. So the patient I am presenting came to us last year. At that time, he was 49 years old. He was a hypertensive and 10 years ago, that is in 2010, he had a type A aortic dissection for which he underwent uh, surgical replacement of the proximal ascending aorta. Thereafter, he was asymptomatic and uh, he was uh, not following up anywhere, but recently he developed cough. And when this was investigated, uh, they did a CT angiogram and they found that the false lumen of the aorta had uh, enlarged aneurysmally. And there was even a contained rupture of the false lumen in the descending thoracic aorta. He also has uh, chronic kidney disease and his uh, creatinine when he came to us was 2.8 milligrams per deciliter. So we did a plain x-ray of the chest uh, and this is what we saw. There's this huge shadow in the left upper chest uh, nearly filling the uh, hemithorax upper half. And uh, if you look carefully, the left bronchus is compressed by this mass that's evident on the X-ray. And uh, this is the CT scan. And you can see that uh, the, this is the aortic root that is uh, normal. And this bit here is the surgical graft, which uh, was put in in 2010. And it ends somewhere here. And after that, we see the dissection. There's the true lumen from which all the three aortic branches arise, arch branches arise. And there's the false lumen, which starts almost immediately after the part of the aorta that's been surgically replaced. And there's this sharp angulation in the surgical graft, which uh, will pose a problem to any kind of procedure you plan to do. Now, this is the cross-sectional uh, image of the CT angiogram, and you can see the false lumen is really giant. It's more than 10 centimeters in dimensions, uh, both ways. And uh, the true lumen is uh, squashed by the false lumen. It's quite anteriorly located. And uh, here's another cross-sectional image. You can see the false lumen wraps around the true lumen, which is extremely narrow at this point. And uh, you can see some blood in the left pleural cavity. And uh, so this is probably a contained rupture that we are dealing with. Uh, this is the baseline angiogram, which shows much the same thing. The surgical graft is 
quite uh, a short length and it ends around the middle of the ascending aorta after which you see the uh, aortic dissection with the false lumen uh, taking off straight after the point where the surgical graft ends and uh, you don't see it opacifying well further down where it is there it's quite large and uh, when you come down the descending uh, the true lumen is quite narrow and in the abdominal aorta the uh, the three visceral arteries, uh, celiac, superior mesenteric, and left renal come off the true lumen. The right renal comes off the false lumen. And this is the 3D reconstruction of the thoracic aorta. And uh, as I said earlier, the surgical graft, which I've uh, delineated with this red arrow, is quite short. It's perhaps just four or five centimeters long and it has a sharp angulation or a kink in it. And uh, soon after the surgical graft ends, you see a true false communication which I've marked with a blue arrow. And then the true lumen is very uh, anteroposteriorly flattened, you could say, and uh, it gives rise to the three arch branches. The false lumen is really giant and it's posteriorly located and goes all the way down to the abdominal aorta. So this is where uh, I will stop and uh, maybe invite uh, comments from our panel as to how would uh, they approach this case. Okay, so uh, that's a very tough case. It looks, <laughs> uh, it's a huge aneurysm. Uh, how about uh, Benjamin uh, coming up with his uh, opinion on this case? What challenges do we see here uh, in this? Yes, hi. So, so to, uh, thank you for, for a great presentation uh, so far of the case, uh, Dr. Jordan. Very impressive. Now, I may have to add, this is one of my bugbears when I see a type A dissection that comes all the way through. And with all due respect to some of the surgeons who operate on this, uh, I, I'm not sure why there is a propensity to just do an ascending repair and not do the full job uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, we see this also in Singapore happening where uh, we see a massive dissection uh, and, and the propensity is just to do an ascending repair. Probably because it's easier, it's faster to get out. But in, in the cases that we see, inevitably, uh, quite a few of them will end up having this situation where the force lumen continues to expand. Uh, and, and I think the concept is that uh, uh, they always think that just by doing the ascending repair and you just pledge it the false lumen at the distal end where they stitch on, uh, it's often enough. But people forget that there's, there are always, as you pointed out, uh, fenestrations, natural fenestrations at multiple levels. And that's what keeps the false uh, lumen perfused and eventually becomes aneurysmal. So, so this is a difficult issue. Uh, and one option would have been on table uh, to actually do a total arch, or perhaps even uh, if, if they could uh, do a proper frozen elephant trunk or a, or a hybrid procedure from the start. Excellent. Uh, uh, so Rao, would you like to make a comment as to uh, what would you now suggest uh, would be a, a better way to proceed, surgery or uh, endovascular repair now? Um, no, endovascular is one thing I would not think about here. Um, uh, I have, I have no, I have in all these years uh, treated one uh, dissection uh, in the vascular uh, transepically. Uh, the patient did well for three days. Um, uh, well, the, I echo Dr. Benjamin Chua's um, uh, uh, sentiments that um, Treating with acute type A's, even if you have dealt with the entire arch, the residual chronic type B's are bad enough to 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 to, to give you lots of difficulties. And if somebody had actually just did the ascending bit and left the arch like this, you're just compounding trouble for yourself for the future. Um, if this is what something uh, that is required to be dealt with in Liverpool, um, it will be an arch replacement under hypothermic circuit arrest, and the the DTA part and the rest of the part will be dealt with on on another day by conventional surgery. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, are you here? Can you yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment on your approach? I'll yeah. say a couple of things. Firstly, I, I, 
I, I wouldn't be too critical of the first operation because I think, you know, this guy's been alive for 10 years after a type A dissection. So, um, you know, he may well have been an extremist and, 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 and the first operation was done to save this man's life. So I, I wouldn't go back and criticise that, particularly as it was 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, it's difficult to know without knowing the details um, as to whether, you know, um, he was stable enough to have a whole arch replacement and a, and a, and a frozen elephant trunk. I mean, there probably, wasn't, there probably wasn't even a frozen ele elephant trunk available in 2010. Sure. Dr. Bedi, uh, so uh, how yeah. would you I think it's a very difficult problem because he's... Hello. Sorry, yeah. Martin, I think uh, we haven't completed with you. Uh, go ahead, yeah. please. I thought you had yeah. So understand? if I can read uh, George, uh, George's mind, okay. what probably he would have done in this case is he would have done a three-vessel fenestration in this patient and uh, he would have gone right up to the zone zero and deployed a stent out there uh, because you have uh, two options out here. One is, of course, to do a debranching. That means go into the ascending aorta and debranch the, both the carotids and then put in a graft across to the subclavian and deploy a device. The second thing, which I, if I can read George's mind, he would have done a three vessel fenestration and completed the whole thing of extending the device probably way down into the thoracic aorta. So this is what I think uh, these two options, which are there, uh, which would be there in George's mind, if I can read that. What, what challenges do you see as a surgeon in this case? Well, uh, I think uh, there are significant one, of course, is a uh, the redo surgery, which is going to be a little tricky in terms of uh, opening up the chest again after so many years, and then you have a huge aneurysm out there. And uh, the second thing would be that uh, if you get that proper zone, the second option is, of course, when you open it up, uh, even uh, closing that rent in the uh, initial zone is uh, not really not really going to help very much. You will still need to cover it across with some stents and all. Or you have to do what uh, the previous speakers mentioned about doing a uh, total arch repair. That, of course, is uh, easier said than done. That has got its own uh, comorbidities and complications which are there, especially in a patient who's uh, already undergone one major procedure about 10 years back. And the second thing is that we don't know if there are multiple re-entry zones out there also at the same time. So you address one issue out here and you suddenly find that after a few months or a few years, this patient comes back to you with, uh, you know, multiple re-entry points and then you are back again extending your thoracic endograft all the way down. So I think the most important part, of course, is tackling the entry point and yet at the same time looking at other re-entry points also. So it is going to be a some bit of a challenge. But what I see out here, although Rao says that there's not much of a zone, I can still see that there's almost about two centimeters of space out there in the ascending aorta, and especially that little bit of a kink which is there, that is something, to my mind, that will give us some benefit in terms of holding the endograft out there. Sanjay, uh, comments from you? Well, uh, you think there's am, adequate I, uh, landing space uh, for your stents? So, as, as Dr. Bedi said, I think George would definitely think of fenestrating this, and my only concern is he would not have enough space to put the graft. So he will have to go into the left ventricle and, and repair and start the graft into the previous graft so that he can close this entry tear. So my concern is, is this entry tear responsible for such a false aneurysm? Because the false lumen actually is wrapped around the aorta and has kinked the proximal aorta because of the pressure of the aneurysm. This kink is maybe not was not so, intended by the surgeon in the beginning, but it's a, no. it's a false lumen which has kinked the aorta, but it probably, as Dr. Bedi said, will give you some advantage of holding the graft, but he has to probably shave off the cone and yeah, go into the absolutely. left ventricle. You have to shave Correct. off the cone, otherwise it will not take the space. So you have so, to go into the left ventricle, maybe put a lundacoost inside, but as I know that he will do a fenestration, and that's why he's showing it. So we have, uh, we if have I can just add on one more yeah. point, uh, uh, Dr. Atul, yeah. uh, what the kink is basically because of the course of the aorta. It is something which happens every time whenever you do an arch, you always get that little bit of a bend because the aorta comes from anterior to the posterior. So the endograft doesn't really, you know, most of the times 
it doesn't really take that exact shape so you might get that it is not a uh, it's a anatomical kink but at the same time physiologically this will not really do anything much to the flow of blood and also that's one thing which is there we see it very commonly especially when you're doing total arch repairs also so, so there's what a I question. agree with the, this one is i would shorten the nose cone absolutely to just about 2 cm or so so that you can engage the nose cone and knowing uh, george he would probably take a wire across the aortic valve and uh, or make a huge what we say a cobra kind of a thing or use a buddy wire also one of those things he would be using for taking his nose cone across so so i have got a quick question yeah. if you are yeah. going to do a fenestration is it going to be a two fenestration three fenestration or one fenestration now my my concern about the fenestrations here and this is exactly why i think the kink will be a problem is your traction and your positioning of the fenestration will be pretty much affected by whether you can take that kink and push your wire through and your nose cone through uh, without a lot of interaction and that may uh, affect obviously the position of your your fenestration so one thing i'm thinking if i had to do this uh, would be to do a single fenestration obviously for the closest vessel and that yeah. would be the innominate and then i'll do a carotid carotid yeah. carotid carotid carotid, 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 carotid subclavian agree yeah yeah so we have a question from dr manoj uh, again for uh, whether a hybrid approach of debranching the arch vessels and then doing a stent graft so we have yeah. comments from dr rao and then from dr jonathan boyd and after that rao would you like to uh, explain your concerns about the landing space um uh, 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 i think uh, a single fenestration for the nominate uh, and introduce transepically from bottom up uh, sounds like a great idea but the nominate at the tangle always comes in an infundibulum it's not a a, a neat little hole like a, 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 a renal artery and the blue arrow which is pointing to the entry tear is just far too close to where the nominate uh, uh, comes to and the uh, rotational accuracy and positional accuracy of in the in the arch is not that particularly good um uh, although all my experience is coming from the femorals uh and 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 single fenestrations or or single scallops putting them through so um it, uh, certainly in in my hands um a, a single fenestrated custom device uh for the, this anatomy um is beyond my my capability my fear is that um uh, it, it is just too close to the entry tear john the dominate ostium is too close to the entry tear mm -hmm. and john so i mean I, I, i think there's i mean it's a very difficult case george is obviously given us something that's very <laughs> tricky i mean there's a there's a big issue with the acute setting and i think if this is a chronic setting we would probably look at options for um a customized you know fenestrated device probably um a bolton device uh, for this um i've got similar concerns about the proximal landing zone which is short and unfavorable um we might look at a transapical approach um potentially but the difficulty here is it's an acute problem isn't it he's got blood in his chest um so we need to do something acutely and i think you know some form of hybrid debranching is probably the the best option yeah If I can just weigh in, Doctor uh, Doctor Mathur, if I can just weigh in, maybe with a single the, fenestration yeah, and debranch everything off the old graft. Uh, if I can yes, just weigh in, Doctor Mathur, the only challenge that I feel out here is you don't have much of a place for doing an auto bicarotid also, because if you look at it, you just have about two centimeters space from the aortic root, and if you're going to uh, you know put in a plumb in a graft out there. then you don't have much space out there for landing your device so i think that's another challenge which is going to be there for the surgical part uh, because when i look at it i think george will probably agree with me that we just have about 2 cm of space even if you use a 12 6 or a 14 6 graph when you look at the bevel your approximately the you know uh, hole is going to be almost about uh, 1.5 cm in which case then you just have about 0.5 cm to engage your stent graft so in that case or probably the better bet would be to just do a total debranching rather than uh doing a you know hybrid so that's another challenge which is there in this case there is also an issue that um 
the difficulty of getting accuracy of positioning the bottom end of this tent graph towards the heart because um, uh, if we come too close down below the past anastomosis, there's the danger that we're going to knock off the commissures, and 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 that, yeah. that, that 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 is not compatible with life. Um, so I, I have great concerns about how that kinky uh, old graft is going to behave, and I, I, I just think this anatomy. But but one thing I would like to ask is that. Um, uh, what is the reason why we cannot do uh, an open repair? Uh, if, uh, I'm sure there is something there, but if we don't deliberately ask that question and put that to one side, there's a danger that the trainees among the, the audience may think that open surgery is a bad thing. Yeah. Sometimes it is really the best solution. For example, Absolutely. for this person, to me, in the right hands, I think that could be the best solution. So we have some suggestions from the audience and Dr. Yadav, Adi Yadav is suggesting a fenestration for all three vessels. So any more comments from the moderators or should we uh, uh, request Adi, George to go ahead? Let George now unveil the secrets. <laughs> all right. So let's see what, how did it go unfold and you know, how George, you uh, went ahead with this case and any time in between George, if you want to stop and ask a few questions from, uh, from us and uh, you're most welcome. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I agree that, you know, if there is a, a good uh, surgeon who is confident to repair this, uh, open surgery is probably the best way to go. Uh, but it would be a very extensive surgery and uh, fairly high risk. So, uh, the, actually the case was given to us by the surgeon who did the first surgery. And he was obviously not keen to go in again. So, we explored the possibility of... Uh, uh, an endovascular repair. Just putting up this slide because this is the software I use to do my planning from the CT. And this is a freely available software you can download from the net. And it gives everything that I want to do this case. So I'll just deviate for a minute and uh, just talk for a, a few minutes on how we do an arch, uh, total arch repair. And this is a patient with a type B dissection. And uh, uh, this is the uh, 3D re reconstruction of the CT angiogram. And if you look at the panel on the right, I've drawn a red line through the ostia of the three arch branches. And uh, we want to look at the aorta uh, perpendicular to this red line in the direction of the yellow arrow. So that software tells us that angle and uh, we can then look at the aorta from a superior oblique view to see the origins of these three arch branches. And then we see the panel on the right, the panel A, you, you get the three ostia, you shave off the branches. And then if you uh, draw circles over those ostia, that's the relationship of the three uh, arch branches. And we want to transpose that relationship onto an appropriate thoracic graft, which is what we have done in panel B. So the same size or maybe a millimeter smaller penetrations are made for the three arch branches, but we retain the distances and the angles. And then we uh, put a couple of radio opaque markers along an imaginary 12 o'clock line. Uh, this 12 o'clock line is the superior position. And uh, I drew that in with a red line so we can see that the innominate is posterior to that 12 o'clock line, the left carotid is uh, anterior, and the left subclavian is kind of sitting on that line. So we, uh, we do the same thing on the graft, and there's this imaginary 12 o'clock line going here. And these are two radiopaque markers which are pulled off the top end of the graft. And then we uh, resheat the graft, making sure that there's no twist on the endograft. And we bring these two figure of eight radiopaque markers up on the surface, just under the graft cover. So we need that to, to be able to get rotational accuracy. And then when, if you do a fluoroscopy of this resheat graft, you'll see what you see in this panel D. These radiopaque markers look like short, straight, lines and they are right on the surface here. So these two 
uh, markers tell us where is the 12 o'clock position. And so when you are deploying the graph, you need to know that. So then this is how it works. Uh, we work in what we call the working view, which is 90 degrees or orthogonal from the plane of the arch. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in the next slide. But when you're in the working view uh, and you bringing the device up, this figure of eight marker, when you reach the upper descending thoracic aorta, you rotate the delivery system to get these markers on the outer aspect of the arch like this. So they will look like a straight line. And then you maintain that position. You don't do any more rotation and you go into the arch and even into the ascending aorta. This marker will always be on the outer curve. And that tells us that the 12 o'clock position or the superior position is always superior or outer. So that's rotational accuracy. So here's the illustration of the same. So panel A tells us how to get the plane of the arch. The plane of the arch is that view in which the ascending and the descending uh, aorta overlap. So here we have a catheter coming up the descending and going into the ascending and they are overlapping. And let's assume this is right anterior oblique 30 degrees uh, view. So the working view will be 90 degrees away from this and that is left anterior oblique 60 degrees view. So in this view, the arch of the aorta is completely opened out. And then when you come in with the endograft with these radiopic markers on the outer uh, curve, when they reach the arch, they will be oriented superiorly like you see in this panel B. This is, these are those two markers. So when you come in like this, you know that your fenestrations are oriented superiorly uh, in the right way. That means the innominate is slightly posterior, the carotid is slightly anterior and so on. So that is rotational accuracy. The other accuracy is axial accuracy. So we need to land these fenestrations just under the target artery. So we mark only the left common carotid artery with a wire. And that's this wire with these two white arrows and we give a slight traction on it so that this wire marks the posterior limit of the left carotid ostium. And the left carotid fenestration is placed just ahead of this wire, just the back end of the fenestration, just touching the wire over here. So now you've got rotational accuracy and axial accuracy. And once you got that, we start, the, uh, start pacing the heart to reduce the blood pressure and deploy the graft. It's as simple as that. So here we have deployed the graft on the right side and you can see the left carotid penetration is just ahead of that uh, marking wire. And these uh, fenestrations are all aligned on the superior aspect. Um, and uh, we are uh, now moving to the case of the day. And here we've done the same thing like I described. We've drawn a red line across the ostia of the three arch vessels. And this is the view that we're going to look at the uh, aorta uh, from a superior oblique angulation. And the same uh, software gives us all these measurements. We can see that the surgical graft measures 28 millimeters in diameter. The aortic root is about 33. And then uh, we got these distances from the uh, between the three arch branches here and we transpose all this onto the graft. So this is the superior view and here this drawing this 12 o'clock line is quite a challenge because you've got to draw it in the true lumen not in the false lumen because the graft is coming in through the true lumen and there's hardly any room there. It's kind of squashed um, anterior posteriorly. So we uh, transpose this onto a graft. This graft was the Balian Captivia 38, 38, 200, not 20. And uh, we uh, were able to measure the distance uh, required ahead of the fenestrations to get a good overlap uh, with the surgical graft. And that distance we found was 63 millimeters. So the first fenestration is 63 millimeters from the top of the graft. And then we have the other two. Um, and we maintain that relationship. And here's the, the figure of eight marker ahead of the fenestrations. And uh, now we have resheathed the graft and we brought this marker up on the surface 
Here you can see the three fenestrations in our net left carotid, left sub, left subclavian. So now we're ready to go in and we have the same system. We have this wire marking the posterior border of the left carotid artery. And uh, we have taken the Lundaquist into the left ventricle uh, because uh, we didn't shorten the nose cone. Uh, if you, uh, there's enough room in the left ventricle to uh, deploy the fenestrations in the right place. And uh, uh, that's the figure of eight marker oriented superiorly. And then we've gone in and now we're a little ahead of the uh, carotid position. So we'll actually start deploying and then pull back a little bit. So this is just before we start deployment. And uh, the other point I'd like to make is how do we pace the heart? Now the uh, two major problems can occur if you do the usual conventional way of pacing. One is the spacing lead may just come out of position uh, and then right in the middle of your deployment, the pacing stops and uh, the blood pressure goes up and the whole graft can be pushed back. So we, don't, we want a very stable uh, position. So the way we do that is we bring this lead in through a long sheath, a long 8F venous sheath, which is in the right ventricle and the lead comes in through that. And this sheath is stabilized by a 018 wire, which is in the pulmonary artery. So we set up this assembly where the sheath comes through a long, I mean, the lead comes through a long sheath and the long sheath is stabilized by a wire in the pulmonary artery. And this uh, lead is a balloon tip lead. So we don't want to perforate the right ventricle. So we bring in this lead and once in position, we deflate the balloon and we check the pacing parameters. Uh, the lead should never be moved with the balloon deflated. That's how you get uh, perforation. In a stable position, you can deflate the balloon. Right, so we deployed the graft and then uh, removed the delivery system and then we cannulated the fenestrations and we deployed the stents in the three fenestrations. We first deploy a self-expanding stent that's much larger than the fenestration. And then uh, just to make sure that it's uh, opposed nicely to the edge of the fenestration, we put short balloon expandable stents at the fenestration. We don't do this anymore. We just use the fluencies now because we find that they, they oppose pretty well without these balloon expandable stents. But uh, that time we were using this combination of self-expanding covered stent with balloon expandable bare metal stent. So this is what we got. We have deployed the graft, we have cannulated the fenestrations and we have extended downwards with a tapered uh, Cook endograft, which is tapering by 10 millimeters and ends a little above the celiac artery. Now this is the angiogram after we finished all this and you can see there is some endo leak and there is this red arrow pointing to some contrast outside the graft on the inner curve. And uh, this was what we feared would happen because the uh, surgical graft has a kink over here and it's very difficult for a endograft to nicely oppose that surgical graft and get a good seal. And uh, anyhow, we uh, continued, we didn't uh, stop. At the lower end, we put a candy plug to seal the uh, false lumen from below. And this is how we make a candy plug. We took uh, Coke TX-238 77 and it has three stents and the middle stent we constrained with uh, two oproline, uh, three two oproline ties and bring it down to about 14 millimeters. And uh, then we deploy it and then we close this narrow part with a Amplatz uh, vascular plug two, uh, which has 18 millimeter diameter. And that's how we close that uh, uh, narrow part of the candy plug. Of course, now you get candy plugs commercially, but not in India. Uh, but this is how they actually started the uh, use of candy plugs. So this is the tapering uh, uh, Cook endograft that's ending above the celiac artery. And on the right, you can see flow down the true lumen. And then in the abdominal aorta, there are multiple true false communications. Uh, the right renal actually comes off the false lumen. 
but there was adequate perfusion uh, for the right renal, so we didn't have to increase any of these fenestration sizes. And uh, the procedure uh, took about four hours, uh, of which one hour was on fluoroscopy, and we tried to limit contrast, but we still used 240 ml of Visitake. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, he was extubated on the table. There were no neurological deficits. All the pulses were felt. Our access sites were good. Uh, blood gases were good. He only needed one unit of transfusion. Creatinine didn't go up. It actually came down marginally. No dialysis required. So very happy, sent him home. But we said, we need to do your CT scan after a month. And uh, this is what the CT scan showed. There is a significant type 1A endoleak, uh, which as I said, is probably where the endograft and the surgical graft uh, overlap. And uh, so this is, uh, where I'll stop again and uh, take uh, the opinion of the panel as to now what would you like to do? Yeah. So, Rao, uh, you were um, that well, <laughs> I should have known better. Um, uh, <laughs> I should have expected him to have to have used three fenestrations, as somebody <laughs> suggested. Um, I, I was clear uh, went. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, George, respect that 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 is uh, uh, one of the most brilliant interventions uh, I had ever seen presented. Well, really, congratulations, extremely well done. What is going through my mind is that um, uh, a couple of things. The uh, I, you, you have not said anything. I don't know whether because you did not use or or because there wasn't time. Uh, you did not have anything equivalent of a diameter reducing uh, mechanism, did you? No, no. So you, you see, uh, having tracked many a device up to that to that point without fenestrations, also what I find is it, it is extremely difficult, particularly in people with narrow iliacs, to get rotational freedom that high up in the chest. What gave you the supreme confidence that you can actually get the orientation, circumferential clock face orientation correct to the extent that you went ahead without the ability to ever adjust it? Because your, your device is already sized and once you unconstrain it, it is falling in such a manner that you have zero control of either longitudinal or circumferential repositioning. Uh, what, what, what are the technical factors that I'm missing, but that gave you the confidence that you can get it? Great points. And uh, <laughs> I'll uh, uh, very quickly skip back to uh, my slide here. Just, just to interject out here, that's George for you. You haven't known, uh, known George that much. We have seen him performing live and doing this thing. And uh, in spite of sometimes getting into a bit of a trouble, he came out of that with flying colors and George would remember that case that we are discussing about. Yes, yes, yes I do. I will never remember that case you're referring to, uh, Dr. Bedi. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but, but really brilliantly done, brilliantly done. I must say, I'm, I'm really impressed. And also, did you track all the branches from down? Because you at least need a nine French. And through the the, the, the bends, et cetera, you probably needed a 10 French catheter, a 10 French sheet. Right, so the stents were all deployed from the femoral axis. Uh, we cannulated the arch branches uh, from in to out, but you can cannulate from out to in and then exteriorize from the femoral and then work from the femoral as well. So all the fenestration stents are deployed from the femoral axis. But coming back to your earlier point, uh, we do not uh, constrain the graft in any way. So when we deploy it, it immediately uh, hits the aortic wall and uh, there is uh, no space whatsoever between the graft and the aortic wall. So the fenestrations have to land correctly. So uh, that's the, the other point is you cannot even if you had space, rotate a graft in the arch. All rotational ability ends in the descending aorta. 
Absolutely. Once you pass the descending aorta, whatever rotational orientation you have, you can just maintain. That's about it. You cannot uh, change it in the arch. If you want to change it, then you got to come back out and uh, do something in the descending and then go back in again. But it's not a great thing to do. So in our technique, all you need to do is in the descending aorta, get the uh, radio peak markers oriented towards the outer curve of the aorta. And then it just rides over this stiff wire, maintaining that position. And so the rotational orientation does not change. Then there is only the axial positioning, which that wire will tell you that you can move back and forth and get it right. So the uh, positioning is uh, done by these two things and then you just deploy the graft. So we have now done this technique for maybe almost 50 cases and uh, we've never had a situation where there was not enough blood flow into the arch branches because we've got pressures being monitored in the left arm, right arm and the left carotid. So the moment you deploy the graft, you know whether there is flow through the fenestrations. What can happen is cannulation may be difficult. And that's what Bedi is talking about. Once we had this uh, difficulty in cannulating the branches, but even in that case, we had good pressures. So that gives you the time to work. So, so yeah, so, so now I'll... So, so, these so just, to, just to add one, add one more point, George, if I could just ask you, in this particular case, you didn't use any pre-wiring. Any particular no, no, reason? No, no. no because normally you do no. that. No, no, we've, we've moved away from that. And uh, we okay. are sure that we are going to land uh, uh, right. So pre-wiring is actually makes it more complex. And uh, but, George, yeah. but George, but George, you have reached that understanding after doing at least 20 cases when you realize that the pre-wiring is not required. Because I remember you have been pre-wiring and now you have right. learned that the positioning is good enough. And it's the important part, I think, is the most important part is the orientation of those marks because yes. once you make them flat you know that they are perpendicular to you and if they are aligned that means they are in the correct position so i think his and the angulation in which he works is predetermined by understanding from the ct ct and you absolutely that that is the most important part of this technique correct. i think george if i understand correctly can you correct me you got it, you got it uh, absolutely right uh, so, uh, George, uh, just for the understanding for everyone, so you have dealt with each fenestration sequentially through one femoral axis, one by one. Right? So you yes. did the nominate first, no. then the left. left no, 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 no. He's gone from top. He's gone from top for all the fenestrations. The fenestrations are all from the brachial and the carotid. Is that no, so? He, yeah, yeah. No, there are two different things in a fenestration. One is crossing yeah. it. And yeah, the second yeah. is stenting it. And the stent. You can mm -hmm. cross it from either side. You can cross from uh, uh, retrogradely from the yeah. limb axis, or you can uh, cross antigradely from the aorta outwards. But finally, we uh, fi make a through and through wire loop uh, from, let's say, right brachial to femoral. And that gives it nice stability. And that's just a soft wire, a hydrophilic wire. And on this wire, we deliver the stents from the femoral approach. So the oh, you're doing it from the femoral? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. that's what I heard. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. So, so, you, so you have done it one by one. So you first cannulated the innominate from the brachial, got the wire, snared it out from the femoral, and then right. did your stent in the innominate, then right. withdrew that wire, and then you put another wire through the carotid, and then right. the subclavian, right? Yeah, one by one. That's, that's the way it would go. Now, if it uh, sometimes we do it the other way, we send the wire from the uh, aorta into the uh, target vessel and then have a small snare waiting there to exteriorize it from the axis that we have in that vessel. Uh, the so, question is, John, uh, George, sorry, are, are you sometimes worried or you're taking a when you take your wire through and through, do you still keep a catheter inside the wire? over the wire because a lot of part there's a possibility of some cheese wiring happening so uh, would you keep a catheter along with that and not take a bare bar a wire especially when you're you know holding the wire from both ends so would that no, be we, of concern uh, we don't uh, use uh, stiff wires these are you know Using the usual thermo. hydrophilic o35 wires 
which are yeah. you we get them in longer lengths we get them yeah. in 300 and 400 centimeter lengths right. so we use those they're soft wires but we never put uh, uh, terrific traction on them we, okay. we always are gentle with them but when right. we're trying to deliver the stent through the fenestration we need a little bit of traction never okay. had this cheese wiring okay. problem with these wires and right. uh, it's one crossing with one wire and that finishes everything you know for that right. uh, comments from benjamin uh, and then john on this so far oh, well uh, beautiful job obviously uh, and uh, nothing less than i expected from uh, dr joseph very very good um, my only concern always about coming uh, down from the carotids in, um, and that's happened to us is uh, occasionally uh, in, in, in a very unfortunate circumstance while you're trying to stand, you also throw a clot off into the brain uh, or pluck off into the brain, especially uh, in a disease aorta. Now, my question is if you had a, a significant pluck as well as you see uh, um, in, in some of these patients, what would have been your approach? Would you have been concerned about uh, causing embolization? Or if you see clots around the aortic root or around the arch? Right. So uh, that is a, if you have significant atheroma in the arch or in the uh, arch branches, then that's a contraindication to this technique. And uh, we would only use it uh, if we had cerebral protection. And uh, we have now developed a cerebral protection technique which got published earlier this year. And uh, maybe I could share that with you uh, sometime. Uh, with that, we are able to then do these procedures. And uh, we actually published a case where in a patient with a shaggy aorta, we were able to do a, a total arch repair like this one uh, with uh, almost zero embolization to the brain. But that's a quite an involved procedure. It needs uh, uh, what we call normothermic anti-grade uh, cerebral perfusion bilaterally. And uh, we create reversal of flow through the arch branches so that uh, even if emboli are liberated in the arch, they don't go up into the brain, they just get washed down. So that's, uh, uh, that is a contraindication to this technique if you do have significant atheroma. But this what about spinal protection, uh, George, at the same time? Because you've gone all the way down to the celiac. Right. We did not use spinal protection in this case, but uh, we do a few things. Uh, one is we maintain the blood pressure, uh, mean arterial pressure above 90 all the time. So that's one thing yeah. we get our yeah. anesthetists to do right through the case. Second is we never sacrifice the left subclavian artery. Uh, we right. always preserve that uh, at all costs. And the third is right. we always preserve the internal iliac arteries. Yeah. And the fourth is we never do thoracic as well as abdominal in the same go. Same setting. Uh, yeah, this, absolutely. This much yes. we may do, but the option of putting in a drain is always there. We keep looking at neurological function in the lower limbs uh, postoperatively. And if there's any sign of uh, paraparesis coming on, we immediately put in a drain. So we do not start uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, till day two or so. Uh, we may just give aspirin on uh, during yeah. and after the procedure. Right. Jo so, jo John, uh, John, did you want to make a comment or should we go forward? Uh, right. So, all right. So then let's go forward. The question I was asking is now what do we do? Yeah. One A leak. So, and, uh, so yeah. I think uh, there are two options which are there. If I can just say if I can think of, one is, of course, opening up the chest and now putting in a tight band around the, uh, you know, endograft out here proximally. That's one option whether that would help. The second thing which probably George would do is that he would come across, go with a catheter, go till the end, to go to the aortic cusp out there and try to wedge in his catheter uh, from the side and get into the leak, uh, into the uh, false lumen out there. Or try putting in some coil or something of the sort Coils. of glue. Uh, anybody else? Anybody has any other different ideas? Jonathan or uh, Benjamin? What we have tried to do is uh, actually come from the false lumen down south, where you put your plug or where there's an uh, existing fenestration, 
track our way back all the way to the root. And then from there, we have injected the uh, coils uh, and glue. Uh, coils and glue. The volume is quite huge, so coils will be quite a bit in there. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that we have tried to do before. Uh, but uh, but here, the, Ben, the point would be that uh, the problem is not the false lumen out here. The problem is that you have a type 1A endoleak, which is more proximal. And as you can see from this image, it is not anything which is going down into the false lumen. He's already put a candy plug out there. So the challenge would be to get across to the arch out there and try to sort out the issue, uh, the proximal part. And because as you can see from the distal point, the endograph looks so beautifully open out there that you don't really see a false tumor opacifying. Well, what, that's why I said that uh, essentially he tries to see whether you can get in the false and come back in again uh, through some fenestrations that exist and are not showing up. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, because I expect natural communications. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. George, George, do you have a stent which you can put from inside to expand that portion by, hmm. you don't so have that option. size of, uh, you can have a CP stent which can go up to that size, but the only issue is, do you have a balloon of that size? A it balloon did, you will get. You could use a Palmer stent here, couldn't you? Because it's going into graft at, at 30, yeah. 30 millimeter graft. And just graft, expand so it, yeah. You could expand a big Palmer's in there. That's an option. I mean, the fundamental so, problem here is that there's the, is the the design of the of the Medtronic See, stent graft is not ideal for this setting, and the, the height yeah. of the stent is too high, which is why you've got the the kink. Right. You really need a shorter you need shorter stents on the graft, approximately. That's yeah. one of the issues, I think. Right. So that's a the, that's a good suggestion, and uh, Atul, if I may proceed, yeah. uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what uh, we did. Um, yeah, so that uh, there was filling of the false lumen like before, uh, straight away after the surgical graft ends. So this is what we did. We got a femoral axis again, and we've got our pacing set up again, and we've got this long 14F sheath coming in from the femoral artery and uh, going right across all the endografts, and it's reached the uh, sinotubular junction almost. And then uh, we have this stent called Andromed. Andromed, yeah. It's okay. a long, thinking about that. a covered stent. Uh, the, this is the largest size they have, uh, XXL. Yeah. And they have something called Andra balloon. And uh, they have a 32 millimeter uh, balloon. So we crimped this uh, stent on this balloon. And remember the surgical graft was 28 millimeters, uh, mm -hmm. as I told you earlier. So this 32 would probably be good enough. Just so right. We brought this stent in. You can see the stent coming in here, but at this point it would stop. So when it reaches here, it just doesn't move forward anymore. And then here's the, the sheet starts backing out. And the, the sheet which was here has backed out all the way till almost the nominate artery. And we've got half the stent out, but we, we can't push it any further forward. And uh, all these angulations made uh, advancement extremely difficult. And uh, we were worried of, about pushing the stent out completely from the sheath because once it's out, you may not be able to get, get it back in. And uh, that would be a problem too, because then you would be forced to deploy it somewhere where you don't want it, especially if, you, if it gets stuck in the arch, then that's a problem. So we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, push it out. We were able to take it back in to the sheath and uh, get it out. So now what would you do? This is not working. And uh, we, we didn't think about those coils and uh, coming through the false lumen. So, so, George, so George, what is the sheath size you require for the stent? Because you can come from the brachial. So, That's one option. And the second okay, option is okay, you take right. the sheath. You take the sheath right back into the LV and then deploy it. No, it's not the problem about going in enough. We, we got the sheath into the aortic root, but when the stent reaches this point, it doesn't go forward anymore and the sheath starts coming back. Because so you, <clears throat> so the other option is that you can put another wire, bring a reliant balloon and try to move that away from the wall to remove the bias. That might work. 
Yeah. So what uh, we thought is so one one exotic uh, possibility is that if you can go transeptal and uh, put yeah. a snare. And uh-huh. grab the distal end of the wire and then pull it a little to change. But the, the judge, judge can do one more thing, which I think he might have done is go from the right side, go to the right atrium to left atrium, catch hold of the wire, and he has he's, he's capable done that. of doing that. He's, <laughs> he's done that. He's done that. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we didn't uh, see that. that adventurous that day, but we thought of mm-hmm. another thing, uh, another. So I can I can say what you would have done, George. Can I predict? Yeah, this is what we did. So you took another graft and you cut it into a piece. Of so it came from left carotid. It came from left carotid. No, no, no. We huh? came no. from left axillary. Oh, okay, <laughs> left axillary. <laughs> so this is the left axillary uh, yeah. spontaneous axis. Yeah. George, <laughs> you, we know that you can do all this. So there is not surprise. <laughs> it's just that we are trying to we are trying to guess your tricks. Yeah, <laughs> right. a bag full of them. But you can see the course this sheet has taken is quite it's different. Different, different. Yeah, yeah. I, you need to change the course of the sheet, and that's it. Because the bias is too much on the outer curve, and that's okay. why nothing was moving. And you're not getting some support from there. The yeah. kink is. Yeah. 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 So this was uh, this worked, and uh, we were able to deploy the stent. That's the 32 millimeter balloon being expanded. We've got pacing going on at this point. And uh, uh, this was the result. Uh, that looks very oh, good. Go and do leak. But there was a problem before this. Uh, I'll go back here. After we deployed this tent, this balloon is so bulky <laughs> that it yeah. doesn't come, come out back mm. into the sheath, and we couldn't pull it bare either because it was abutting the left subclavian fenestration stent, and there right. was. A risk of dislodging that stent. So we were stuck again, you know, how to get this balloon out. So any suggestion if this balloon doesn't come back into the sheath, that is the left axillary sheath, and it doesn't come back bare either, because it's snagging the left uh, subclavian sure. stent. I think uh, one option would be to try puncturing the balloon. No, oh, balloon deflated. Is balloon is deflated. <laughs> It's, the profile it's, is too it's big. deflated, the, okay, but it's yeah. so crumply and uh, you know un, uh, uh, unwieldy. It uh, it doesn't uh, go into a smooth profile. It's uh, very you took a larger larger sheet yeah. or something of the sort. No, but remember, we had left axillary. We've already reached fourteen French. Uh, okay. Uh, so what we actually did was we came from the femoral with a snare and caught the tip of the balloon and. Oh. Uh, we're able to move it from the ascending into the descending aorta. So the balloon is now in the descending aorta, okay. and, uh, but it would still, still not come back into the axillary sheath. So then we did one more thing. We, we cut the balloon shaft and uh, mm. pulled the snare and the balloon into the femoral sheath and took it yeah. out from the femoral arch. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. That's boy. <laughs> You lead a real charmed life, George. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so once you're there, you've got to get out. <laughs> so that's how we got the balloon out. So watch out for that 32 millimeter balloon. It's extremely yeah. bulky. Uh, anyhow, this was the result we got. There was no leak. And look up there on the left axillary artery. That There's a stent there, yeah. yeah God we did a UNC stent there and closed off that uh, puncture oh. point. So there was no... Yeah. So the everything has been percutaneous so far, no no cut downs right. at all, and then uh, uh, so this is what we had before that procedure. This leak marked by the red arrow, and this is what we have afterwards. Now, if you look at the surgical graft, you can see those uh, uh, yeah. you know those angulations are no longer there. Kings. The, the, exactly. the stent has kind of ironed it out and expanded it. And now there is good apposition between the surgical graft and the aortic endograft. Uh, right, so this is one year later. He's doing very well. Uh, there is no leaks anywhere. Uh, the, all the fenestration stents are flowing. That's the left axillary stent that's also flowing. There is, of course, the false lumen uh, patent in the abdominal aorta, but that's not increasing in size, so we don't need to do anything right now. 
you're uh-huh. not looking at putting in a petticoat or something of the sort converting it into a no. petticoat see if at all we did anything we would do a fenestrated repair all the way down to later the... on yeah um, rather and than... there's a right renal coming from the false lumen also yeah so we would yeah, fix yeah, that yeah yeah but with petticoat it's a bare stent so that's why anyway but it doesn't really help very much i guess right so although a lot the... of people are yeah on the right you can see the thrombosed false lumen and this uh, your candy plug is nicely seen candy plug uh, absolutely you can, you can see the uh, avp2 uh, plug sitting inside the tx2 endograft so that that this is now one year after the second procedure so is is asymptomatic and uh, uh, so I, i looked at how people have been treating uh, residual type a dissections and most of the literature has been with the cook uh, endo branched arch device and uh, mm-hmm. this is a paper that came out uh, this year and they looked at uh, how many of these type a residual uh, dissections are actually el- uh, eligible for endovascular repair endovascular up at this figure of about 2/3 2/3 of oh. these patients could have an endovascular repair and uh, if the surgeon were to make a uh, better landing zone at the time of the initial surgery this percentage could actually go up and uh, that is an important message that probably needs to go out to the surgeons and then there was this uh, uh, retrospective multi center analysis of cases that they have been done so far 70 cases with uh, fairly encouraging results the only downside they note is need for repeat procedures in uh, about a sixth of these patients uh, which is exactly what we experienced we had to go in and repeat uh, yeah. uh, procedure but uh, this is a way out so i think jotech jo- is coming out with something like that for the type a oh, okay not aware of that so it is possible to repair uh, residual type a dissections with uh, fenestrated grafts and uh, but this kind of anatomy where you have a short kinked surgical graft that is a real and a real challenge to arch tiva so perhaps in the future surgeons should attempt to replace as much of the ascending aorta as possible during the initial surgery to provide a landing zone for future arch tiva uh, yeah. thank you so that's that's this great case. work that's that's an excellent case george you know so fantastic uh, here, yeah. uh the patient started with cough you know does he still have the cough no no <laughs> he's he's totally asymptomatic he is very happy and uh, uh, he, he's actually planning to get married again he, you know he was a divorcee <laughs> <laughs> that's a you know, exotic case well, a really exotic case And I think George is already coming to him, George. All of you, yeah, yeah. Rao, uh, comments from you, Rao, and uh, each one of you. No, well, we well I, I, I was just congratulating uh, uh, George um, on 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 a on a case extremely well done. Um, uh, it, it, these are exceedingly difficult ones, uh, and 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 George never uh, sees this impressing. So excellent. Uh, Uh, John, are you there? Uh, I thought it was a very impressive case, you know, fantastic and great, great result. So I had a couple of technical questions I was going to ask George. One was, why did you choose to put a Cook TX2 inside the Valiant? Why didn't you just continue down the thoracic aorta with a Valiant tapered piece? Right, that's a good point. Uh, the reason we changed to TX2 is because it has a 10 mm taper. There, they, they do have these 36, 26, 38, 28, and so on. And uh, we want to end in the lower descending thoracic aorta with as small a diameter as possible, so that we don't get a late uh, stent-induced new entry. So we like these tapered grafts coming down into the descending aorta. Oh, that's interesting. And so, uh, Sanjay, if I can, yeah, Doctor Bailey. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. Let Sanjay speak. 
no problem. Yeah, so uh, uh, George, George, I'm not surprised uh, because he's capable of doing so many things, and you know that's why I call him George Exotica, because <laughs> <laughs> so George is a is a master, and of course he, the most important thing is the thinking which goes behind it, and I think I must appreciate that. the imagining of things in your head before you do these things is the most important step in his mind which is what i feel is the most important part of doing these things and i would ask some comment from george what does he think about my idea that you need to imagine in your head what you're going to do and the ct helps you to do that and that is the basic understanding which comes from these cases is crack the code as i would say Yeah. yeah. Basics. Sanjay right is absolutely basics. right. Uh, you got to be very fluent with reading CT angiograms, and uh, you got to do it yourself. Uh, yeah. You could have a fantastic radiologist who will tell you everything you want to know, but uh, unless you can actually do it yourself and get a feel for the case, uh, you will have some problems somewhere down the line. Not that uh, I don't have problems, but you can minimize them. So. and then the other thing is to uh, more than that george uh, if if i may 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 may, may say uh, i mean we you know the uh, we have started uh, and a surgeon started to use uh, ct planning about 15 years ago in the uk the vast majority of us do our own planning and very familiar absolutely there is something a bit more than that which uh, impresses me here more than anything else which fills me with awe is um the confidence and one thing i know with intervention is that things do go wrong and i always like to have a spare thought in my mind as to what i'm going to do what is my plan b so Sorry. when plan a goes wrong what is going to be my b and when b goes wrong what is going to be my c, c. how am i going to exit and always trying to 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 put myself Uh, as late as possible into a point of no return uh, uh it, it, some of the you know this is an example where um uh, i am unsure in my mind what plan b was <laughs> you have extremely quickly entered a point of no return and that actually tells you a, a degree of confidence that that you have uh, uh you need to start bottling that and selling it to us <laughs> that is uh, that's a good one so uh, so he's george is working so, in a, a missionary hospital you know so he yeah. doesn't think in our <laughs> terms yeah. so if i can just so uh, ask uh, one question to george george what uh, after looking at the way the andromeda behave would you have uh, considered considering that you are an expert in you know uh, surgically modified graph taking a piece and then you know dividing the graph shortening it up and then deploying it inside the ascending aorta so that at least you know one the profile of the that device is much better and uh, you were you will be able to take it right across where you want to putting in a, a little larger graph and uh, deploying that about 5 cm or so and do the same job like what the andromeda did would you consider doing uh, that because i thought that maybe that was the thought which came to your mind no i i another endograft would not solve the yeah. problem the That's issue here is the uh, yeah. issue here is the endograft that we have deployed cannot oppose well to the surgical graft because the surgical graft is kinked so we need something with uh, very high radial strength to push okay. outwards and uh, bring that bring the two grafts together and that is only possible with a balloon expandable large metallic stent Uh, and another endograft is not going to do that so a, a palmas stent or an equivalent yeah. of that which is what we use that is the only thing that's likely to work in this situation but yeah. then the issue is bulk and uh, the difficulty of delivering and difficulty yeah, of the problem it. is because you have to you crimp the stent yourself unlike that they don't come as a pre crimped stent so that is another oh. challenge that because it's a nice bigger profile the right. nose cone and all is a little bit more bulbous with any kind of a hand grip device i think that is what you would agree yeah yes of course that's why we use a 14 french sheet so that right. there's enough room for that uh, yeah. stent to go in right but then the issue was these angulations which made it uh, very yeah, difficult much more difficult yeah right 
This has been an excellent case, George, and I can see a lot of comments uh, with accolades for you. Very impressive case, great outcome, great, great case, well done, impressive, standing ovation, the thought process in planning, the fenestration, which you are a master in meticulous execution. It goes on and on, and I can keep reading it, but we are already beyond one hour, and we have had some very, very great discussion. Uh, panel over here, and all masters in their own right. And uh, George, you have really kept us dumbfounded. This is such an impressive case. And we look forward to seeing some more interesting work from you in the future. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us, spending this very precious time to share with all our other colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks bye. Very much. bye, -bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Great thank job. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Goodbye.